Hello everyone this is part 1 of what if Naruto was reincarnated as Don Quixote do Flamingo, and this story is made by Azumi Bear, I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down but God thread had been broken, Don Quixote do Flamingo knew that he had been defeated. His only hope now was to survive the full brunt of Monkey D. Luffy's King Kong gun, a task that was beginning to prove very difficult. Bringing his haki to its utmost limit, Doffy was able to bear the initial pain and impact of Luffy's attack, at least at first. After what seemed like an eternity, Doffy's body had finally reached Dressrosa, and proceeded to tear straight through the small kingdom. He could feel the stone and dirt below him crumble and fold around him, driving him deeper into the earth and closer to the secret underground facilities beneath Dressrosa. Even though he could feel his former kingdom split apart from his impact, his momentum showed no signs of slowing down. Eventually, his back met steel as it reached his underground operations and the steel tore like paper. The pain at this point was excruciating and it took all he had to maintain consciousness and keep his haki up to protect him from the debris. He could feel his focus waning as his body was assailed by torn metal, and, for just a moment, his focus broke, his haki fell, a piercing pain formed in his chest and everything turned to black. Doffy's eyes began to open ever so slightly. As he awoke he slowly starts to notice the several marines around him, scurrying with medical supplies. Wondering why, Doffy looks around until he remembers what had happened moments ago, finally noticing a steel support beam lodged into his chest. His body felt numb. He tried desperately to use his devil fruit to try and repair some of the major damage, but it was impossible, the damage was too great. The marines were trying their hardest to keep him alive to bring him into custody but he already knew his life was escaping him. The captain of the Don Quixote pirates began to chuckle lightly. For 30 years, he had dedicated his life to destroying everything the celestial dragons cared about. For 30 years, he and his family had grown and thrived to be where they stood up until this day. 30 years of his life, and it was ended by an idiot in a straw hat that couldn't find his way out of a wet paper bag. He would cry if it wasn't so funny or even possible at this point. He could feel his vision fading, his limbs losing even the numbness they once held and now felt as if they were disappearing. He was about to die. Trabol, Diamante, Pika, Virgo, he thought, picturing them in his mind, the people who had come to raise him, the person who was his childhood friend, the ones who had become his family and the ones that he had failed. I'm sorry, he thought, darkness taking over his vision, until he decided to finally close his eyes, a small smile replacing his usual manic grin. It was then that Don Quixote do Flamingo, the heavenly demon and captain of the Don Quixote pirates, had died. Don Quixote do Flamingo did not think much of the afterlife when he was alive, but even he had thought of what waited for him at the end of his days. Whatever he had expected, be it fire and brimstone or an endless existence in purgatory, this was not something that he imagined. Doffy found himself surrounded by darkness, yes, but there was more. It was like he was in some form of cocoon, a barrier of warmth that wrapped around him protectively. He found it almost impossible to move his body and, speaking of his body, it felt off, disproportioned and more importantly incredibly weak. Where was he? He took a moment to relax his mind and concentrate, to listen. He could feel and hear his own heartbeat. A good sign but also confusing. Did I survive, he thought. Were the marines medics able to somehow save him? No, that was impossible, the amount of damage he sustained was too severe and the one who bore the heel heel fruit would never try and save his life. Putting that issue aside he continued to concentrate, listening past his own heartbeat. After a moment he began to hear another, one separate from his own. This was odd, especially because the heartbeat sounded like it came from all around him. Not bothering with trying to solve this mystery quite yet, he decided to use his haki to sense his surroundings. As soon as he attempted this he had felt a wave of exhaustion hit him, only letting him use it for a moment, but it had worked. He had felt a few auras around him but what he had found confused him. One aura, he could sense several feet away from him and it was powerful, clearly belonging to a seasoned warrior. There was another aura, not as strong but still fierce, this one, along with another, confused him. This aura was all around him, it was large and surrounded him completely as if he were inside its owner. Now, Doffy was not a fool. He had many years of experience dealing with the most cunning minds in all the new world, so it should not be surprising that he had an idea of what had happened to him and where he currently was. Single quote. I'm an infant. 
This revelation was one of both shock and slight amusement. First that straw hat boy kills me and now I'm an infant. Well, a fetus really but still, the very thought made him laugh hollowly in his mind. But there was one more mystery to solve, one more aura that his haki could sense. Its nature and location confused him, however. It was unlike anything he had ever encountered, powerful, overwhelmingly powerful, and evil, sickeningly so. It felt like it was right next to him, yet, at the same time, locked away in a place he could never reach. Now that he felt it for the first time, its presence was just there. Whatever it was, he could feel it, just behind that incomprehensible barrier. And now that he could feel it, now that he could sense its rage, he knew that it was watching him, that it knew he was watching it, and it did not like being watched. However, the mind of Don Quixote do Flamingo, the heavenly demon, simply grinned. Life within the womb, Dorfi had learned, was very boring and disorienting. There was little to do while trapped there and time seemed almost non-existent. But he knew that time was passing, his body had continued to grow, growing stronger if only marginally so, and soon he would be free. The thoughts of freedom brought other thoughts as well. Where and when would he be in his new life? Would he find himself flung into the far future? Would he still have the opportunity to get his revenge on the celestial dragons? These thoughts had plagued Doffy for most of his time in his new home. There was also what he began to call the entity that lived with him in his new mother. He would continue to watch and observe it and found something interesting. The entity was releasing some form of energy into his mother's body, this energy was thus flowing into him as well. When he felt it, it seemed wild, almost primal in a sense with that same feeling of maliciousness that the entity exuded if watered down. As far as he could tell it was not harmful and he had no way of stopping it either way. He continued to examine this energy as time went on and discovered that his mother also had something similar. Unlike the entities, hers was warmer, calmer almost and somewhat soothing if he had to admit it. What was really interesting was how they interacted. With the help of his haki, that would still take up a lot of his stamina, he found that his mother's energy seemed to be almost shackling the others, controlling and mitigating it. After discovering this, he looked into himself, so to speak, and discovered that he contained his own energy as well, separate from the ones supplied to him by the entity and his mother. Not that he could really do anything with it though. He mostly spent his time examining these various energies, trying to kill his utter boredom. As time passed he began to feel it. His body had been growing and his prison was growing smaller and smaller. His limbs were now capable of small movements and he knew now that it wouldn't be long. While in this near timeless place he had time to think. Before, he relied on his family to do many things for him, though they did it happily of course. He was stronger than the rest of his family, yes that was true, but that was not because of any considerable effort. Duffy, after coming out of his childhood, had been stronger than most around him. He rarely trained his body and hardly ever practiced his techniques, there was no need to. He had his family to do most things for him and he was superior to most of the scum of the world anyways. That was how he had always thought, and then Straw Hat Luffy had proved him wrong in both the worst and best way possible. In this new life, there would be a new Doflamingo. One who would fight to get everything he would ever need with his own two hands, one who would not know, who could not rely on his family to do things for him. The cage around him had suddenly tightened around him. It was time. A brand new Don Quixote Doflamingo would emerge in this new world, and usher in a new age. He hated this. This entire process was uncomfortable, humiliating and if he didn't have so much pride he would say a little scary. Dorfi was completely helpless as his nine-month prison tightened and squeezed him, pushing him further to his exit. He didn't know long his torture lasted but eventually he could finally see it. Light. Just a moment later a wave of frigid air assaulted him, but he didn't care, he was free. The light and chilly air disoriented him for a moment but eventually he felt himself wrapped in what was presumably a blanket. He opened his eyes but could only make out the outlines of shapes and various colors. There was no definition and the world was a blurry mess. He felt himself being carried and eventually placed in front of who he assumed to be his mother's face. He strained his senses, trying to make out anything familiar around him. His ears could hear what sounded like speech, but it sounded almost garbled, he just couldn't make out the words. His eyesight was also still limited, he looked up to view his new mother's face but could barely make anything out except the distinct color of red. He really hoped it was just her hair. 
His first mother died rather early on in his life and it would be rather saddening to lose another so quickly. A moment later he was carried a bit further away from his mother. Suddenly, he heard what he easily recognizes as a scream come from the nurse currently carrying him, another pair of arms quickly grabbing him as the nurse fell. Startled, he saw a hand raised threateningly above him through his blurry vision. He tried to see who it belonged to but couldn't. He could hear his new retainer speaking to someone, his mother or father perhaps when they suddenly flung him into the air. The world swayed around him as he was disoriented, then he felt someone catch him. He activated his haki, attempting to identify the aura of his attacker, but something very odd happened just before he did. The various colors around him changed in an instant, and he could now feel a slight breeze where before the air was still. His haki, short-lived that it was, could now only sense the person carrying him, who he had recognized as his father during his time in his mother's womb, with no trace of his attacker. His use of haki had quickly drained his stamina and he could feel sleep already approaching his small body. Once again, his surroundings had suddenly changed, and he could feel his father place him down onto a soft surface, a bed. He tried desperately to stay awake and was successful for a few minutes. Soon after he felt someone else, someone much larger than him, being placed in his bed, the distinct color of red returning. His mother, laid next to him, cradling him in his arms and a moment later sleep had finally took him. He awoke again, his eyes revealing a still blurry world, but it was clearer than before. He was laying in some sort of crib and there were two others standing over him. He looked at them, seeing that distinct color of red, his mother, and a brilliant gold, most likely his father. There was something else, it, the entity, he could feel it just behind his parents, looking past them, he saw a mountain of reddish-orange, in a form he wasn't able to make out. It was filled with a hate he was now very familiar with. It was then that he noticed it, a nail, or more accurately a single claw piercing through both his parents' bodies, inching closer and closer to him. He could hear his parents speaking but his ears refused to translate the cacophony of noise aside from the entity's roars of anger. Then, suddenly, he felt a burning sensation in his stomach, and energy being poured into him that he easily recognized to belong to the monster that had just killed his new parents. Its power flowed into him and when it stopped his eyes began to close and he welcomed some much needed rest. It had been quite some time since the date of his birth. In that time, he was able to learn his new name, Naruto Uzumaki. It was rather pitiful compared to Don Quixote do Flamingo, but it would have to do. He found himself now being raised in an orphanage, having never seen his parents after his first day in this new world. He was still under the age of one year old or, so he thought. Time was still quite hard to keep track of but at least now he knew when it was night or day time, he estimated he was at around six months now. His sight and hearing were now significantly better, and he was capable of standing on his own if he had something to lean on. He was able to crawl as well when his caregivers gave him the opportunity. Speaking of his caregivers, he found them quite odd. There were three different women working at the orphanage. They took care of him as well as any other child but with a strange sense of detachment, like it was just a job to be done. Now, while that is technically true they only had this quirk when it came to him, the other children they treated as if they were their own. The looks they gave him were reminiscent of a different past he was never able to forget. Despite these issues Dofi, or rather Naruto now, quickly began a routine to further himself as quickly as he could. He would crawl and perform small exercises to help develop his body and practice talking when no one was around. It wouldn't do to have adults hear a six-month-old speaking words it shouldn't yet know. He was able to use his observation haki much more efficiently now as well, though he never tried using the other two types. Sadly, it seemed that his devil fruit was now lost to him as no matter how hard he tried he was never able to conjure his beloved strings. Furthermore, he had continued to investigate the energy that he discovered early on in his new life. He could feel the entity's energy still, but it seemed almost muted, trickling into him from somewhere he couldn't identify. The beast itself seemed to be almost asleep, no longer aware and watching him as it did when he first arrived in this new world. His own energy, separate from the beast's, was now much, larger, than before. If he concentrated he could control it to some degree, moving it around through bizarre channels in his body, but he didn't know what it was or what he was doing. He continued to manipulate it regardless, trying to piece together its purpose but still hasn't discovered it yet. 
Looking around, Doffy, Naruto found that the room he was in, a rather large nursery with other cribs and infants, was currently missing any caretaker, with the other children currently asleep or content on their own. He used this opportunity to sit his small and still pudgy body up. He stood on wobbly legs and, using the sides of the crib as support, practiced walking around the edge of the crib. Using his haki, he made sure to watch anyone approaching the room. He had been practicing for a few minutes, when he suddenly felt two large auras in the other room approaching the nursery. As quickly as he was able, he laid down and stared at the ceiling, making small movements and sounds to give the impression that he was just a normal six-month-old baby. The door opened a moment later and the two powerful auras walked into the room. With his ears now in much better condition, he was able to make out what they were saying. Which one is he? A voice, deep and slightly rough, asked its counterpart. He's just over there, in the corner of the room. Another voice this one sounding older and belonging to what would seem to be a rather heavy smoker. The two strangers walked to the right side of his crib, looking over him allowing Doffy to see who was interrupting his training session. The man on the right had bright white hair, it was long, tied in a ponytail behind him with two large bangs framing his face. He had a strange headband on with the kanji for oil upon. His face looked somewhat young with but a small wart on his nose, but his white hair made it hard to discern his age. The other was considerably shorter than the white-haired man, and older as well, with gaunt skin and liver spots dotting his face. He was wearing white robes and strange diamond-shaped hat. The two looked down upon him until one finally spoke up. So Jiraiya, care to explain why it took you six months to respond to my summons? The older one spoke, his face seemingly calm but clearly, he was irritated. The taller man, Jiraiya, hesitated for a moment, his face set in stone, then he responded. When I got news that Minato and Kushina were dead, I immediately set my spy network to ensure that no news was spread about their child. The old man's face flashed a hint of irritation before calming, then speaking again. And it took you six months to accomplish this. Without any contact with your home that had just lost their fourth hockage. At the mention of this, fourth Hockage, Jiraiya visibly flinched. He was silent for a moment, his eyes taking on a hint of sadness. His reply was quiet, with a tone of defeat, yeah. The two stood there for a moment, silent, continuing to look down on Dofi, Naruto as he continued his charade. The old man let out a small sigh. Very well, what are you going to do now then? The boy has no other family and you are his godfather Jiraiya. The white-haired man took in a large breath of air, held it for a moment and then released a large sigh. Well, I can't imagine myself taking him in, I'm just not father material honestly, even if it's just as a godfather, he said, an arm reaching behind him to scratch the nape of his neck. Honestly, he'd probably have a better childhood here, in the leaf village. The older man glanced at Jiraiya, who did not meet his gaze. You're sure about this then? If he finds this out he may not forgive you. Jiraiya continued to look down, not even truly looking at Naruto anymore. Yeah, I, I'm sure, Jiraiya's voice was quiet and the older man closed his eyes for a moment. Very well, he said, opening his eyes to look at Naruto, he'll be raised through the Leafs Orphanage services then. I'll look after him as best I can Jiraiya, but I am Hokage again, and I am not as young as I once was. Jiraiya quickly responded, I understand Sarutobi-sensei, almost interrupting the older man. The two stood there a little more before Jiraiya vanished in a small puff of smoke. Sarutobi sighed, he could at least leave the building normally, he grumbled, taking one last look at Naruto before walking out of the room, gently closing the door behind him. Duffy, sensing that the old man was gone with his haki, stopped his small charade and thought about the conversation he had witnessed. So, it would seem one of my parents, Minato and Kushina, was rather important, this, fourth hockage. I know where I am now too, the Leaf Village, quite a strange name. Duffy continued to pass through the conversation. I have one more family member as well, a godfather, Jiraiya. Duffy mouthed the name of the godfather that abandoned him, then said the name aloud. With that name firmly in his mind Duffy stood back up and continued his training, with a smile that did not belong on a child's face. Two years, Naruto Uzumaki, or rather Don Quixote do Flamingo, was finally two years old. Last year, he was finally moved out of the nursery and was given his own room to sleep in. 
It was rather small, more like a closet than anything else, but unlike everyone else in the orphanage he did not have to share the room, giving him the privacy needed to continue his training. He also was finally able to go outside as well, to the small playground just outside the orphanage and see just what kind of village he lived in. When Jiraiya had called his new home the Leaf Village, he was expecting just that, a village. Instead, he was greeted by a large city, with oddly shaped buildings and various pipes and wires traveling across them. This, village, was unlike any other he had ever seen, which was saying something. He also took notice to the large mountain with four large stone faces engraved onto them, overlooking the village. He recognized the Hokage, Sarutobi from his encounter with him, meaning the last face on the right must be the fourth Hokage, his father Minato. An important man indeed, to have something like that dedicated to you. Dofi had also made an effort to try and, socialize with the other children. Needless to say, that ended in disaster. For one thing their vocabulary was extremely limited compared to his own making conversation utterly meaningless. The games were far too simple and trivial for him to take part in. Also, he got the feeling that the other children didn't like him much. He didn't know why though. He made sure to have his best smile on his face as much as he could, almost always. Oh well, it didn't really matter. These children were just orphans after all, no one important. There was no need to start building any relationships with the rabble after all. He had his eyes on much bigger prizes. This, village, was ruled by those with the title of Hokage. The current Hokage, who he learned was named Haruzan Sarutobi, would visit the orphanage now and again. Though he made it seem he was just visiting the, unfortunate, children without parents, Dofi knew that he was really checking up on him. Sarutobi would also come to deliver a sales pitch about being, ninja, this village's military force, of which the strongest was elected as Hokage. He explained to the orphanage that children can go and attend an academy where they would learn how to become the heroes that protected their home, ninja. It did not take Dofi long to decide that the Ninja Academy would be his first stepping stone in his new life, telling the Hockage to sign him up. But there was something else that was bothering him as well. Small things about his new home that had puzzled and slightly worried him. For one, he had heard no mention of either the world government or the marines in the past two years. The naming conventions here were also different. The style of names were different than what he was used to, usually more complex than simply, Trabol, or, Baby Five Feet. Everyone here also would introduce the given names first and surnames last if they had one, the opposite of what he was used to. He had no way to confirm it but, he didn't think he was in Kansas anymore. Regardless, Naruto Uzumaki continued his life in the orphanage, a grin on his face and a diamond-shaped hat in mind. Anako Hamadate did not like Naruto Uzumaki. She had run this orphanage for almost 20 years now and, while there was the occasional bad apple, never in her life would she say that she did not like any one of the children living in her orphanage. Naruto Uzumaki changed that. She knew that young Naruto was the Jinchuriki of the nine-tailed fox, that was really an open secret at this point, but that wasn't why she did not like him. No, there was something else, something off about the child. When he had first arrived at the orphanage, she was wary of him, knowing his status as the fox's container. She did her job, took care of him and that was it, end of story. After a while, she began to notice strange things about him. His eyes seemingly holding an awareness that didn't belong in such a young child. Some days, she could have sworn that she had seen the young boy in his crib, practicing to walk a couple months ahead of others his age, but lay right back down as soon as she had walked in. That wasn't what had disturbed her the most though. When he was young, the boy would almost never cry. It was only when he needed to be changed or feed, never anything else. Eventually, even that stopped altogether. When the boy would fall and scrap his knee or when the older kids would try and pick on and bully him, never would he cry. No, instead there was just a smile, a grin if you could even call it that. It looked normal to most yes, but after seeing that smile every day for over a year Anako knew better. There was something wrong with that smile, with that boy. The other children knew it as well. They would hardly ever interact with him anymore, and when they did it would not go well. That boy would simply smile at them, brushing them off and almost ignoring them completely, as if he were looking down on them. It wasn't just his social skills that were off either. The boy moved with grace, an elegance and control that a five-year-old should not possess. He walked with confidence wherever he went, with that damned smile never going away. 
He was stronger than others around him as well, she had seen him beat children that were almost twice his age and had training in the ninja academy, though he never instigated the fights. Yes, Anako Hamade truly did not like Naruto Uzumaki. He had shown an interest in becoming a ninja as well, a terrifying thought. And with that thought in mind, she signed the letter she had written to the Hokage, his official guardian, calling for his immediate removal from the premises. Normally, she would feel bad for sending a child out all alone into the world, but Naruto Uzumaki was not a child, this she was certain of. Haruzan Sarutobi was not having a good day. It, like almost every other, was filled with monotonous paperwork and political strife that he was well and truly sick of at this point. He remembered a time when he enjoyed these things, but now he was missing the retirement that Minato was so kind to bring him. He grabbed the next obstacle in his path to the day's end, what looked to be a letter addressed to him, and filled his pipe with another round of tobacco. He read the letter as he did so, stopped for a moment to put his pipe down and re-read the letter, hoping that he had misread it. After, he sighed and, with weary hands, set the letter down and picked up his pipe. He sat there for a few minutes, enjoying the downtime that he honestly felt he deserved. When his pipe ran dry, he quickly scribbled a reply to the letter he had received, signed it and signaled for one of his anbu. Yes, Lord Hockage, a tiger-masked anbu had appeared kneeling in front of his desk. Haruzan handed the folded-up letter to the agent. Take this letter to Akino Hamadate at the Southern Orphanage, he ordered, his voice firm and calm to hide the frustration he was currently feeling. Without another word the Anbu agent disappeared to fulfill his orders. Haruzan got up from his chair, stretching his back that sore from constantly sitting down for the past few hours. As sad as it was, Haruzan had anticipated this happening and had already rented an apartment in advance in case this situation ever occurred. He walked out of the room, entering the hallway and greeting his secretary. I'm going out for the rest of the day. Push any appointments I have to tomorrow. Not stopping to hear her answer, the Hokage continued to walk out the tower and made his way to Naruto's soon-to-be former home. His pace was slow as he greeted the various villages around him. He was not looking forward to this. While he enjoyed visiting and speaking with Naruto, telling him that he was going to be living alone from now on was not something he was eager to do. The villagers were quite wary, afraid even, of the young boy. That fear spread to their children as well, ostracizing Naruto and making it very difficult for him to make any friends. He knew this, it was something he was keenly aware of. His decision to reveal Naruto's status as the nine-tailed fox's Jinchuriki was a hard one. There were many ninja that night, watching the ceiling happen. Who knew what kind of rumors would be spread if left alone? To mitigate this, he had decided to reveal Naruto's status making it clear that he was just a normal child and that he was a hero. That decision clearly went well. Still, Naruto himself did not seem to be bothered by this if he was aware of it, which he undoubtedly was. He was a smart kid, advancing well beyond his peers in pretty much all things. When the two of them would get a chance to speak, he didn't feel like he was talking to a child. Honestly, Naruto reminded him of Itachi, with eyes too old for such a young soul. Like Itachi, Naruto was talented as well. Haruzan had already suspected that the boy was a censor, never being surprised when the Hokage would drop by, almost knowing that he was on his way. His physical abilities were quite impressive as well if Anako's letter is to be believed. Defeating multiple academy students that were almost twice his age with no formal training was quite a feat. Haruzan continued his steady pace toward the orphanage. No doubt by now Tiger would have delivered the letter and Naruto would be almost done packing his things, what little he had anyways. Haruzan's thoughts eventually strayed to his now wayward student, Jiraiya. All those years ago, when he had come with him to visit Naruto, Jiraiya had disappointed him. Was that unfair? Perhaps, he knew that Jiraiya was in a lot of pain after Minato's death. He had spent most of life searching for his child of prophecy, and finally he had thought he had found him in Minato. Minato and Kushina treated him like family, something Jiraiya never had. And in the end, he lost everything in a single night. Naruto was a reminder of that pain, of everything he lost. Yet Haruzan couldn't help but see it as a Jiraiya running from his responsibilities. The two still kept in touch via letters though only for official leaf business. Still, Haruzan would mention the boy in his letters, encrypted of course, and mention his hardships and struggles, hoping to convince him to change his mind and return. He never even bothered to acknowledge them.
Yes, in Haruzan's eyes, Jiraiya was just running from his responsibilities. Finally, Haruzan had reached the orphanage and approached the front. Already, he could hear the sounds of children playing and laughter. He waited for a couple moments until the door finally opened, Akino there to greet him. A short, brown-haired and rather heavy-set woman but one that he had known to be a mother hen through and through. This thought only made him more disappointed in her, an emotion he was beginning to be feeling far too often. Ah. H. Hello L. Lord Hockage, her voice trembling slightly. There was a small look of shame in her eyes that could barely stand to meet his own. What stood out most though, was there was the look of determination in the rest of her features. He didn't have to do this. As Hockage, he could force her to continue keeping Naruto in her care, but that look meant that she was adamant about getting him out of here. If Naruto did stay, his life would only go downhill from here as the caretakers began to neglect him more and more till he was already independent. It was best to get it over with now instead. Take me to him, his replied with his voice demanding and possessing an air of authority. Akino startled slightly, wide-eyed, and nodded, turning around to guide him to Naruto's room. The two went through the building, with Haruzan smiling at all the children running up to greet him. Soon, they made it Naruto's room, and not even bothering to knock, Akino opened his door and walked in. Hey old man, what took ya so long ha? Huh? rung out a young voice, full of amusement and mischief. Looking inside, Haruzan spotted young Naruto. He was leaning up against the far wall, his arms crossed and a small backpack sat down in front of him. The short blonde-haired boy, was wearing his ever-famous grin, a bright pink shirt on with equally bright white shorts and black shoes. He had on a pair of oddly shaped sunglasses, with a silver frame and red lenses. Naruto had asked for them during last year's Rinya festival that they spent together and wore them every day. In fact, Haruzan couldn't remember seeing him without them on since then. Yes, without a doubt, Naruto had quite the flair for the dramatic. It didn't bother Haruzan though, he had seen stranger things, and stranger people. Haruzan smiled lightly, then chuckled a bit. Well when you get as old as me it takes a bit longer to get around, he said humoring the boy. Hey hey hey, sure old man. Whatever you say, Naruto replied, seemingly laughing at some inside joke. Naruto pushed off the wall, kicking his backpack up and looping one of the straps around his shoulder in one smooth motion. Now come on old man, let's go see this new place ya got for little old me, he said, walking past him and Akino and toward the front door. Yeah, quite the flair for the dramatic indeed. The Hokage followed him to the front door, amused by Naruto's antics. Now Naruto, shouldn't I be leading the way? After all, I doubt you'll know where to go after we walk out that door. Naruto, finally at the front door, opened it and bowed dramatically, gesturing for Haruzan to step out. Of course Lord Hokage, I was getting the door for you. One should be respectful to their elders. Hey hey hey. Naruto, with that grin still plastered on his face, laughing at the barb about his age. The two walked out of the orphanage, now side by side, they began to walk closer to Naruto's new apartment. It was located closer to the Hokage monument and thus the academy as well, which Haruzan signed Naruto up to begin attending next year. As they walked through the village, the various villagers would often stop to look at the two, and not in greeting like they did when he was alone. They would often move to the other side of the street to avoid being close to them. Seeing this, Haruzan looked down at Naruto. Naruto seemed to be ignoring this, grinning like always and his eyes hidden behind his stylish sunglasses. Haruzan sighed a little, looking at him. Naruto had a bad habit of walking a little strangely. His hands would be in his pockets and his legs would move at an almost exaggerated pace, lifting up far too high when he walked. But he was mostly concerned about the way Naruto would hunch his head, as if he were too tall and trying to duck under something. They passed by and stopped by a few places, getting Naruto food, clothes and various supplies like utensils and dish soap. The apartment was already fully furnished and Haruzan would leave further decoration up to Naruto. Continuing away from the market, Naruto stops and turns, standing still for a moment. Hey old man, what's the building for? The child looked up at Haruzan pointing at a building to their left. Haruzan looked over at the building Naruto had pointed out. It was a fairly large building, two stories and with the red shingles making up the roof. The beige walls shone obvious signs of wear, spider web cracks running all along them. He knew this building quite well, watched both its construction and the need for its use. 
Built during and after the First Great Shinobi War, it housed all of the war orphans that the war had brought and has done so for the second and third as well. It was a building that symbolized the pain and hardship that the leaf had gone through, and a prison for the children whose parents were sacrificed in her name. Haruzen looked down at the boy. Naruto looking towards the building, his usual smile missing from his face. That's the first orphanage that was built in the Hidden Leaf Village. Why is there something the matter? He asked, curious. The boy stares at the building for a moment longer, eventually looking away and continuing. Nothing, let's keep going, as he called back to him. They continue towards where Naruto will be staying. They finally walk up to a beige building with maroon-colored shingles. Standing about four stories tall it was a plain apartment building. As they proceed to follow up the stairs to the top floor and stop at the third door on their right, at room 4C. This will be the building you will be staying at. Opening the door, he revealed a single, small, plain room with dim green colored walls and a wooden floor. In it was a bed with a small nightstand and alarm clock, a small desk and chair with a small radio on it and a single dresser. And this will be your new room. Naruto, after adopting his smile again on their way to the apartment complex, entered his new room, looking around. The two walked through a small doorway leading to the kitchen, where a small refrigerator, stove top and a small table with four chairs served as Naruto's new dining room. There was another door in the kitchen leading to the bathroom. Haruzen put the bags of groceries on the dining table. So, what do you think, Naruto? Haruzen asked, eager and slightly nervous to hear the boy's response. Naruto looked around the apartment for a moment, his smile dropping for a moment. Then his smile returned and he looked up at the old man. It looks like shit, old man. Hey hey hey, Naruto said, laughing. Rather disappointed but not very surprised the third Hokage sighed. Language, Naruto Peruzan reprimanded him, handed him a spare key and then continued, I'm afraid you'll have to live with it for now, at least until you become a powerful shinobi and earn some more money. Speaking of, the Hokage reached into his robes and pulled out a small bundle of money, handing it to Naruto. As of this moment you'll be receiving a fixed income every 30 days from the hidden leaf in order to help take care of yourself. This is all you'll be getting so be sure to spend it wisely. The Hokage moved out of the kitchen and into the main room, with Naruto following him. Also, I have enrolled you into the Ninja Academy for next year. As long as you'll be attending you won't have to worry about paying any rent or utility bills. Naruto flung his backpack off his shoulder and onto the bed, his grin widening as he flipped through the bills that Haruzen just handed him. After flipping through the last bill, Naruto spoke up. Anything else I need to know, eh? Naruto asked still gleefully looking at the money in his hands. Haruzen shook his head at the young boy's greed, and replied, no that's everything for now. I'll be visiting in a few days to check up on you and if you need anything I'm usually at the Hokage Tower. Haruzen opened the door, ready to head home and relax for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah, see ya later old man, Naruto waved him off and closed the door behind him. With that, Haruzen made his way home, this time traveling by the rooftops. There are many thoughts about Naruto on his way home. What Naruto was thinking and what his future was. As much as Haruzen hated it, there were many things that rested on the boy's shoulders, too many. He would do all he could to make sure Naruto went down the right path. Hopefully he wouldn't be the only one for much longer. Doffy closed the door behind the old man, the smile on face dropping for a moment. Ever since they passed that building, the other orphanage, what his haki had sensed had been bothering him, distracting him. Looking out the window in his new apartment, the sun was beginning to set. He would investigate it tomorrow. For now he would settle into his new home. He put the things that the third had bought him away into its new designated areas, made some dinner for himself and, after he was done eating, laid in bed. He lay there for a while, trying to sleep but the orphanage situation still bugged him. It took a while, but eventually sleep took him. Doffy woke again at the crack of dawn, like always. He got out of his new bed and decided to enjoy his new freedoms. He used his own shower and bathroom, no longer having to share it with various other orphans. He cooked his own breakfast, something he was slightly out of practice of but was more than capable of. Changing clothes, Doffy grabbed something, a gift, out of his backpack and exited his new apartment, locking the door behind him with an objective in mind. Slowly, Doffy made his way over to the orphanage that he and the old man had passed yesterday. 
It took quite a bit, as Doffy had a bit of trouble remembering exactly where it was but he found it again eventually. It was just before noon now and just like at previous home, there was various children playing at a nearby playground. It was like clockwork, as soon as he was in range that Aura was back, calling out to him through his harky. Doffy with his signature smile walked onto the playground and spotted two benches sitting back to back in the middle of the park. He walked toward it, slowly, tracking that aura through his harky and sat down on one of the benches. Then he waited, his eyes staring straight ahead of him and his smile dropping. There, a boy was a few meters ahead of him. He was quite odd looking, a bowl-shaped hair cut, thick eyebrows and large, round eyes with rather prominent eyelashes. A small frown adorned the boy's stone-set face, a perfect example of seriousness. The boy walked forward at a steady pace, his hands neatly folded behind him. He continued to approach him, eventually reaching the bench Doffy sat at. Rather than sit next to him, the mysterious boy circled around, sitting at the bench just behind him. The two sat there a moment, back to back, the sound of the other children playing around them. Doffy reached into his pocket and pulled out the gift, a pair of sunglasses. Taking them, he reached over his shoulder, offering it to the other boy, who smoothly reciprocated the action, taking them from him. Doffy could hear the boy unfold them and place them on his face. They say there for a moment, until finally, the other boy greeted an old friend. Doffy. Don Quixote do Flamingo grinned. Virgo. The two sat there, at Doffy's dining room table, somewhat awkwardly, both of them eating the lunch, some sandwiches, Doffy had made a few minutes ago. Not really sure what to say to each other, they ate in silence for a few minutes until one of them finally broke the silence. So, I see you brought back the bowl cut, Doffy said, his usual smile slightly twitching, desperately trying to think of something to converse about. Virgo was not helping in the slightest, just sitting there stoically with a slice of ham stuck to the side of his face. Virgo sat there for a moment, chewing his food, then swallowed. Yes, it seemed appropriate. He returned to his meal. The awkwardness came back. Doffy sat there for a moment, slightly stunned and at a loss for words. Hey, ah, uh, yeah, Doffy somewhat replied. He then pointed to the side of his face, ah, uh, by the way, you got something. Doffy, Virgo interrupted. Doffy's smile fell from his face. This wasn't good, Virgo never interrupted him. In all the years the two had known each other, the two always respected each other. No. Doffy knew, Virgo was livid. What happened, Virgo continued, looking directly at him now, that stern expression on his face. Doffy paused for a moment. He knew what he was asking. Virgo was well aware by now how he himself arrived in this strange new place, and now they were both here. Doffy's smile returned as he looked up at the blank ceiling of his apartment. Then, suddenly, he began to laugh. He laughed and laughed, not able to contain himself and Virgo watched all the while, his expression never changing. His laughter stopped as quickly as it came, his smile turning into a frown. He sat there, still looking at the ceiling. I lost the two sat there, Virgo watching, and Doffy waiting for his response. He didn't have to wait long. I see, Virgo replied, his voice calm. Virgo scooted back in his chair and stood up, walking toward the exit. Doffy looked down watching him leave, slightly confused. Then Virgo, looked behind him, grabbing the slice of ham that was stuck to his face. Follow me, he said, popping the leftover ham into his mouth, and with that the two of them left the apartment. After leaving the apartment, Doffy continued to follow Virgo, a frown replacing his usual smile as he contemplated what was going through Virgo's mind. They walked for quite a while, almost an hour if he had to guess, reaching what looked to be a forested area in the village. This is one of the training grounds located inside of the village, Virgo said as they walked through the forest. It's used by various ninja, this village's military force, as a location to spar and practice dangerous techniques. Do Flamingo was silent for a moment as they reached a clearing in the forest. Walking toward the center of the clearing, he replied, I see, and what are we going to be doing here then? The two walked toward the center of the field, Virgo still not answering his question. When they finally reached it, Virgo stopped, with Doffy forced to stare at the young boy's back. We, he asked. Virgo turned around, looking back at Doffy, his hands still neatly folded behind his back. We are not going to be doing anything. You, however, he said, as his hands slowly emerged from behind his back. 
are going to try and survive. With that said, Virgo's form rushed toward him, his hands curled into fists. Duffy, surprised and taken aback from the unexpected attack, quickly tried to call on his haki and lashed out with a mid-high kick at Virgo's midsection. As soon as he delivered it, he realized his mistake. His legs, now much shorter than his older bodies, never reached him as he sent the kick far too early. Virgo advanced closer to him, ignoring the wayward kick, and threw a right punch straight at his chest. Doffy's haki failed him, too startled by the situation of his longest friend suddenly attacking him and his attack failing. He brought his arms up in an attempt to block the attack, another mistake. One does not simply block an attack from Virgo. Just before Virgo's fist made contact with his arms, it took in a black metallic sheen, and crashed into Doffy's defense. Armament hack, he didn't even have the chance to finish the thought, as his defense was torn apart by the enhanced attack. His body was launched from his now previous position, not stopping until he had finally crashed into one of the trees in the forest behind him. He could feel the bark of the tree crack and splinter as he collided with it. His new body screamed as it felt the greatest amount of pain it had ever known. Falling to the ground, Dorfi lay there for a moment, gasping for breath and looking up at Virgo. Virgo stood there, his stern expression giving way to show grief and pain. His hands were folded behind his back now, but Dorfi could tell they were shaking. Dorfi, Virgo said, his voice trembling, something that Dorfi thought he would never hear. For over 30 years, you were my king. Over 30 years ago I dedicated myself to serving you, protecting you, my only friend. All of us did. He stopped for a moment, looking down at him, then continued. But now, we know that isn't enough. You must become more than a king. You must become a warrior, a leader, someone who does more than rule his people, or else we will meet the same fate. I won't allow that. I will not let you lose again. Virgo said, raising his voice, almost screaming near the end, again, something Doffy thought he would never hear from him. Now, stand up. Resolving himself, Doffy stood up. The sun was setting by the time they were done, and the two boys began their long trek home for a much-needed rest. Doffy, his smile now back on his face, had his arm wrapped around Virgo's shoulder, who was helping him walk back home. He was an utter mess. Virgo, even in a much younger body, hadn't lost his touch. He beat him into the ground over and over again, but Doffy, knowing why he was doing it, didn't really mind. Until the fourth beating anyway. Virgo had just a few scuffs and scrapes on him comparatively. Having a body a year older than his own gave a distinct advantage. That's what he tried to convince himself of at least. Overall, Doffy was rather happy to have his friend back and the two limped their way back to the apartment complex. After a little more than an hour and the sun beginning to disappear over the horizon, they finally made it to his front door. Stumbling into the apartment, Doffy threw himself onto the bed and relaxed. Resting for a moment, he sat up and looked at Virgo, who was opening the door again, preparing to leave. H. Hey, Virgo, where you're going? Doffy cried out, a bit alarmed that he was leaving so soon. Virgo stopped and turned toward him. I have to return to the orphanage, it is almost past curfew and it would not do for me to suddenly go missing. My new name is Lee, by the way. Doffy rubbed the back of his neck, frustrated. Yeah, you're probably right. Next time I see, M I'm gonna ask the old man to get you a place here too. Virgo paused for a moment in confusion. Old man, he asked. Doffy grinned in amusement, sitting up further on the bed. So, get this. Apparently this boy, he said, pointing at himself, Naruto Uzumaki, is related to some pretty important people. That includes the old man, the third Hokage. He's been watching over me for quite a while and he has a hard time saying no to the poor orphan boy of the late fourth Hokage. Hey hey hey, Doffy said, laughing at the end of his explanation. Virgo was silent as he took in Doffy's words, then he nodded. Very well, I will return tomorrow and we will resume our training. Inform me if there are any updates in living arrangements. With that said, Virgo stepped out of the apartment, closing the door behind him. Dorfi laid back onto the bed, his smile fading as he started to once again feel the bruises and soreness in his muscles. He kept replaying the events of the day in his mind, convincing himself that it wasn't all a dream. After a few minutes he made and ate dinner and laid back down for some much needed rest. The third Hockage was having a pretty good day. 
It was well past midday and after having his half day off when he took Naruto to his new home last week, he felt refreshed and was able to catch up on his paperwork. Smoking his pipe while enjoying being able to actually see the surface of his desk, he decided that he was going to go visit Naruto today. Standing up and stretching his aching back, he decided to be rather adventurous today, exiting out the nearby window like so many of his other ninja decided to do far too often. He chuckled to himself as he sensed his Anbu scramble to catch up to him, not expecting his dramatic exit. He jumped from rooftop to rooftop, the wind rushing past his face, reminding him of his younger days. On the way there, he thought about Naruto, and the plans he had for the boy. He was already planning to grab Kakashi from Anbu soon, preparing him to eventually lead Naruto's team and become his teacher. He thought about letting Naruto graduate early. He knew Naruto could pull it off if he wanted to, but he decided against it. He saw what was becoming of Itachi, the latest young, prodigy, and he refused to let the same happen to Naruto. He already had enough on his shoulders, even if he didn't know it yet. As he continued to make his way over to Naruto, he looked over the village. The villagers on the streets, smiles on their faces and some children playing, ninja, down the street. Seeing it made him happy, but a little sad as well, knowing that no one saw this as he did. That this was only still possible thanks to Naruto. That thought made him think of Minato, and the night of the Nine Tails attack. That night filled him with regret. He was known as the professor, the master of 1000 techniques and yet he didn't know the one technique that would have saved Naruto's family, and the village's fourth hockage. He knew it now, of course. Knowing that if the nine-tailed fox was ever released, the reaper death seal was likely their only hope and he made sure to memorize every aspect of Minato's notes about the now legendary technique. Putting those thoughts aside, he finally made it to Naruto's front door. Taking out his spare key, he unlocked the door and walked in knocking at the same time. Naruto, a yuho, perusan stopped talking. When he walked inside he saw a peculiar sight. Norto was home yes, with his signature smile and bright clothes, but there was another boy with him. He had a bold cut hairstyle and, like Naruto, had a pair of sunglasses on, his were silver with black frames unlike Naruto's silver and red. He recognized them as another pair that Naruto had owned. He must have given them to the boy. He wore a plain green t-shirt and blue pants with black dress shoes, with a rather calm, almost stern expression on his face. The two of them seemed to be exercising or playing some kind of game. Both of them doing a one-armed hand stand, trying to see who would fall over first. Ah, uh, hello Naruto, who's your friend and, what are you doing? Haruzan asked, a little confused but eager to meet his new friend. Naruto's smile widened and he sprung off the ground, flipping backward and landing in a crouch with his arms spread out, making a small pose. A second later, the boy stood up, chuckling slightly. Hey hey hey, we got tired of waiting for ya, so we decided to play a game, see who could stand on one arm the longest. Haruzan smiled, thinking, so he really is a sensory type, and a gifted one as well. Being able to sense me for that long at the speed I was going means he could tell where I was from pretty far away. Impressive. And your friend, Haruzan asked, curious to see what kind of person would make friends with a boy like Naruto. The other boy smoothly rolled to his feet, folding his hands behind his back. Walking up to the Hockage, he formally bowed at the waist. Greetings, Lord Hockage. My name is Rock Lee. Thank you for all of your help, the now named Rock Lee said, confusing Haruzan. Um, thank you for what, the third asked, a pit forming in his stomach. This was, apparently, Naruto's cue as right after he spoke, Naruto made to answer his question. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. I'm adopting this kid old man, so I'm gonna need ya to do the paperwork and get me some more money. Hey hey hey. Yes, the third Hockage was having a pretty good day. He really hoped he could retire soon. He was too old for this shit. Sasuke Uchiha was a very proud boy. He was proud of his family, proud of his brother and proud to say that he was the strongest there was in his generation. These three points remained true throughout his childhood, all until he entered the academy that is. He remembered the time he first saw him, the brightly colored boy with a grin too wide, too persistent to be natural. Other than that, Sasuke never thought much of the boy, thinking he was just some weirdo. But that changed quickly. On the last day of the first week of school, the instructors held a small sparing tournament for all the new students. 
a way to test how far along all the children were and what they would need to learn the most in their first year at the academy. Needless to say, Sasuke was confident. He was an Uchiha, a member of an elite clan and had trained hard to gain the skill he had today. He had sparred with older students in the academy already, fellow Uchiha, so he knew he was skilled. Being the only one in his class only further increased his confidence. He watched the other students spar, waiting eagerly for his turn, his chance to represent his clan and show the others just what Sasuke Uchiha was capable of. Finally, it took a while but the instructor, Iruka sensei called his name. With the female portion of the class cheering and chanting his name, he strutted up to the ring, waiting for his opponent to be called. Naruto Uzumaki. With his opponent's name announced he looked out toward the group of students, waiting for the poor soul to step up. The way he walked was wrong. Everything about him was just wrong. His legs, rising too high, exaggerating his every step. The way he kept his hands in his pockets, as if they were something that he didn't want to waste on something so insignificant. He was hunched over, as if he were looking down on him despite them being the same height. And that grin, it told him everything his eyes should have held but couldn't be seen behind those glasses. There was hate in that smile of his. Sasuke shook those thoughts from his head though. He had a fight to win. He had a father to make proud. Naruto finally reached the ring and stood a foot across from him. The two made the seal of confrontation at Aruka's request, something they had learned yesterday in class, and at his mark, the spa began. The two stood there for a moment, waiting for the other to make the first move. Getting tired of waiting though, Sasuke started the engagement. Jumping slightly into the air, he performed a picture-perfect whirlwind kick aimed at Naruto's head. Naruto ducked at the knees, his hands still in his pockets and the grin never leaving his face as Sasuke's leg passed right over him. Growling slightly, Sasuke completed his mid-air turn and, still suspended in the air, aimed a drop kick onto Naruto's crouching form, a variation of the leaf whirlwind he was taught by his family. His leg rocketed down toward Naruto, intent on slamming into the back of his head when, suddenly, just before impact, Naruto disappeared. His attack missing, Sasuke landed on the ground confused on what had happened. Hey hey hey, he didn't just hear it, he felt it. The laugh from behind sending chills down his spine, causing dread to form in his stomach. He quickly turned around raising his arms to block any sudden attacks, but there were none. He just stood there, his hands still in his pockets, that damn grin still on his face. Sasuke's heart was racing, his breathing speeding up until he was almost panting. That smile, that damn smile. Was he mocking him? These thoughts took over his mind, clearing away the dread and nervousness that filled him before. Instead, he saw red. He charged at the boy, intent on ending this clown that dared to make a fool of Sasuke Uchiha. Sasuke didn't even see it coming. A strong force impacting into his chin launching him back and forcing him to stare at the light blue sky. He landed on his back, dazed. Arching his head, he looked at his opponent, desperately trying to piece together whatever the hell just happened to him. It didn't take long. He was still standing there, with just one difference. One of his legs, still extended in a full front kick at chin level. A kick, he thought, I, I was beaten, by a single kick. By then, Aruka had already announced Naruto as the winner, who lowered his leg and walked back to stand with the other students. Sasuke got up, shaking the dizziness from his head, brushed himself off and did the same. Aruka asked if he was alright but he ignored him. No one was cheering anymore, no one was chanting his name. The spars continued but Sasuke wasn't watching anymore. All he could see was that damn grin. Fujimaro Tarada had been an academy teacher for almost 40 years, yet never had he seen a student quite like Rock Lee. The boy was like a machine, he learned and adapted quickly, never being surprised or phased by anything, even when Fujimaro made an honest effort to do just that, and he always had a stern expression on his face. Honestly, if he had never seen the boy eat and drink, he wouldn't believe he was human. Speaking of, the boy was an absolute slob, always coming into class with the remains of his breakfast or lunch all over his face. He didn't know how he never noticed either. It wasn't like it was just a couple crumbs or anything. At one point there was half a hamburger just kinda glued to his face, waiting for someone to point it out to the oblivious boy. He remembered watching one day just to figure out if he was doing it on purpose. He promised never to do that again.
A slice of salami in a sandwich he was eating just sort of slipped out of his sandwich and floated onto the side of his face, with Lee never even noticing. He vowed to never figure out that mystery. That made the boy weird and eccentric, yes, but that wasn't why Fujimoro thought Lee was quite special. No, the reason he was so unique in his eyes was because the boy was a monster. Fujimoro was quite fond of using spas in order to drill his lessons into his young pupil's impressionable minds. That was what made Lee stand out so much. The boy could fight. He was fast and efficient, easily able to predict his opponent's moves and react to them in just the right way. He was tough, remarkably so. Fujimoro once asked Lee to help him demonstrate a judo throw. With the boy's skill, he thought Lee would be able to land on his feet and recover from the throw. But when Fujimoro grabbed the boy's arm, and threw him over his shoulder and toward the ground, he did nothing of the sort. Lee smashed into the ground, taking the full brunt of the attack. Worried for his student, and also his job, Fujimoro quickly knelt next to him, trying to assess the damage. Lee's face was as stern as ever, and without a moment's hesitation, stood up and dusted himself off. Folding his hands behind his back, he joined the other students, leaving an imprint of his body in the ground. These things made Rock Lee a talented young ninja yes, but what made him a monster was his brutality. The boy was cruel, he could see that. In his spars he went out of his way to deal the most damage possible to his opponents, and often toyed with them, dragging out the bouts for as long as he could when he could easily end it. What was worse, was the way he accomplished this, as if he had done it before, as if he had experience. Now, when he thought of Rock Lee, he didn't think of a young talented academy student aspiring to be the very best he could. No, now he thought of a ruthless machine that wouldn't hesitate to put his enemy six feet in the ground. So, why didn't Fujimoro report this to the Hockage? Because, when he thought back to the wars he fought and the friends he lost, he couldn't help but think that he could have used a man like Rock Lee at his side. Writing, 100%, on the piece of paper, Fujimoro put the paper into the stack on his left, and began grading the next test. Kakashi Hataki was rather antsy today, something he was not used to feeling. Most of the time he was lazing about, relaxed and reading his book. When he wasn't, he was focused and determined, ready to complete his mission and protect his comrades. Antsy was not something he was used to feeling, but when the third Hokage asked to meet with him in his regular guise rather than his Anbu uniform, the Anbu captain couldn't help but become restless. Travelling over the rooftops of the Leaf Village, he quickly arrived at the window in the Hokage's office and let himself in. You wanted to see me Lord Hokage, he drawled out, standing in front of his desk and an orange book in his face, sounding completely disinterested. The Hokage looked up from the document he was examining, looking annoyed with him. Yes, in fact, I wanted to speak with you about three hours ago. Giving the god of shinobi, his traditional eye smile, he stayed silent waiting for the Hokage to speak. The aging, god, took a drag of his pipe before speaking up, I'm pulling you out of the Anbu. Why, Kakashi immediately interjected, curious as to the Hokage's reasoning. They both knew he was one of the strongest shinobi in the Anbu Black Ops at the moment. His departure would mean a drop in mission success rate and, more importantly in Kakashi's eyes, a rise in friendly casualties. The Hokage stood up from his chair, turning around to look out the window and look upon his village. Naruto is nine years old now, he said, the mentioning of Naruto startling Kakashi for a moment. The Hokage continued a moment later. He will be graduating in a few years and he will need a Jonin sensei, said the Hokage, taking a long drag from his pipe. Kakashi hesitated for a moment before speaking up. Still, I don't see why I have to. You have been a part of the Anbu for many years now Kakashi. You have been used to working with the best of the best, but if you are to teach a group of genin, you will need to lower your expectations. Besides, the Hokage said, sighing slightly, after seeing what had happened to Itachi, I would have released you from the Anbu anyways. The two stood there silently, thinking about the words each had said to the other. Very well, Lord Hokage, Kakashi spoke first. Good. The Hokage turned around, reached into his robes and pulled out a small book, tossing it over to him. Kakashi caught the book, opening it up. What's this, he asked, flipping through to the marked pages. The latest graduates, replied the Hokage. It'll be a while until Naruto graduates. Until that time, you can join the rest of the elite Jonin and start testing potential Jonin. Of course, Lord Hokage. Is there anything else? 
Kakashi asked, desperately hoping the answer was no. No, you're free to go. The Hokage returned to his chair and picked up the previous document. Kakashi leaped through the window, completely eager to read about his potential new students. The conversation brought back bad memories, memories of the child he was hesitant to meet. Naruto. With that thought, Kakashi returned home, steeling himself for the new challenges his shinobi life would bring him. He wasn't worried though, after all, shinobi endure. Shikamaru Nara liked to think of himself as a rather intelligent nine-year-old boy, as much of a drag that intelligence often was. Still, that same intelligence and the perception it offered made him very curious about the boy named Naruto Uzumaki. To be short, Naruto was an enigma. At first, he thought the boy was just another class clown, with his wide grin and strange choice in clothes. It did not take long for Shikamaru to reassess that previous conclusion. The strange boy had shown, through his class ranking, that he was very intelligent, holding the position of top student with almost no competition. He did it almost effortlessly, constantly slacking off and skipping class. Shikamaru found him to be, for lack of better words, somewhat creepy as well. The way he would simply smile at you, his eyes hidden behind those glasses of his. His laugh being a curious thing, as if he were laughing at a joke only he could understand. One day, after school, Shikamaru took it upon himself to challenge the talented boy to a game of shoggy at the park, a board game that his father had taught him, a game only his father could beat him at. Naruto agreed and, after explaining the rules to him, the two began. It was the most grating experience Shikamaru ever had. At first, Naruto only looked at the board to make his move, the rest of the time dedicated to directing that sickening grin straight at him. He would chew ickle now and then, as Shikamaru would contemplate his next move, further unnerving him, and the two would never speak. About five minutes later, well into the game by now, Naruto wouldn't even look at the board anymore, his hands moving almost autonomously to shift the pieces around the board. The pressure at this point was crippling. Shikamaru was being outplayed at every turn and all the while he refused to look up from the board. He refused to look up at him. It didn't take long after that. Another five minutes and he was swiftly defeated, his nerves breaking his concentration. Honestly, he wasn't very confident he could win even if he had held it together. Now, Shikamaru couldn't say he disliked the other boy. No, he had no animosity for Naruto Uzumaki, but he knew someone who did. There was no doubt in Shikamaru's mind that Sasuke Uchiha, loathed Naruto Uzumaki. He would see it very often, Sasuke constantly trying to one-up the blonde-haired boy and every time he would fail. Every interaction between the two would instantly become a competition to Sasuke, Shikamaru knew that. Yet to Naruto it was just a game, with him laughing at Sasuke's attempts. Shikamaru would laugh if it wasn't so sad. He knew their situation, everyone who paid attention did. 1. The orphan boy who never had any parents yet always had a smile on his face. The other, a boy whose parents were taken from him, by his own brother no less. Shikamaru couldn't help but feel pity for them, ashamed at how happy he was to not know either pain. Shikamaru rose his head from his desk, escaping from his thoughts and looking at Aruka, still drawling on about something or other. He took a look around the room from his seat, the highest seat in the right corner of the room. Sure enough, there they were. Naruto was sitting at the front row, leaning back in his chair with his feet on his desk. He was chewing some gum, blowing rather impressive bubbles until the gum popped, rinse and repeat. A couple rows behind him, was Sasuke. His elbows were leaning on the desk in front of him with his hands folded in front of his face. Even from here, he could tell Sasuke was aiming a murderous glare straight at Naruto. He got the feeling Naruto knew it too, and was enjoying every bit of it. Thankfully, the bell began to ring, and the students packed their things and hurried out the door, ignoring Aruka's words to remember to do tonight's homework. Once the majority of the students left the room, Shikamaru followed behind them, heading outside. Seeing the group of students in front of him, he spotted Naruto in the crowd, something that was fairly easy. Naruto broke from the group of students, taking a different path home than the one that Shikamaru usually saw him take. He thought about following him, seeing what he was up to and maybe getting to know him a bit better, but decided against it. It was too much of a drag. After leaving the academy Doflamingo started to make his way down to the training grounds that he and Virgo began using four years ago. 
he was by himself today, with Virgo deciding to go shopping and grab groceries for the both of them. It had been surprisingly difficult for him to convince the old man to give Virgo a place of his own, especially considering the old man spent most of the time trying to explain that, one, he was too young to adopt a child and two, said child was older than him anyways. He did not respond to, you worry too much, old man, very well either. Still, three hours later, Virgo got his own key to an apartment just across from his own. Yeah, Doffy was a manipulative bastard, all right. Picking up his pace, Doffy took to the rooftops and sped along to the training grounds, making records time. Sitting down in a random area of the forest to avoid any interruptions, Doffy got to work. He had a small list of objectives to accomplish today. He was already capable of using the three basic techniques the academy taught. He had something else in mind for today's training session. First, was meeting with the nine-tailed fox. Yes, it did not take him long to figure out that, the entity, was in fact the nine tails. He figured it out the first time it was covered in his first year at the academy. Sitting down in his small area of the forest, Doffy closed his eyes and concentrated. He sat there for quite a while, his usual smile absent as he stared at the back of his eyelids. A half hour passed and he was starting to get sore. Frustrated, he sat up quickly and opened his eyes. He was greeted by a dark damp sewer, water serving as the floor. Doffy looked around slightly confused, concentrating his senses to figure out where he was. He was at an intersection in the sewer, tunnels in four different directions revealing nothing but darkness. Then, to his left, he heard it. Breathing, slow and steady but easily identifiable. Hesitating for only a moment, Doffy placed his hands in his pockets and traveled closer to the sound. He didn't know how long he spent walking. Time felt almost skewed here, walked in a way. He wasn't sure how to explain it. Eventually though, he reached it. A very large room with an even larger gate, two metal frames with massive metal bars separating him from what lay inside. The gate was closed and near center of the gate was a single piece of paper, the seal. The inside of the gate was shrouded in darkness, hiding whatever it imprisoned, not that it was much of a mystery. A grin appearing on his face, Doffy walked up to the gate, stopping a few meters in front of it. As soon as he stopped, a claw emerged from the gate, rushing toward him and stopping a couple inches from his still grinning face, the gate stopping it from coming any further. Doffy expected as much, and he knew the claw wouldn't reach him from here. After all, he had seen it before. Seeing his attack miss, the fox pulled his hand back, the darkness that once shrouded the cage disappearing, revealing an enormous orange fox with nine tails. Doffy looked up at the beast and heard a loud, deep voice come from him. Well, if it isn't my little warden, I should kill you where you stand. But, this seal. The fox stopped for a moment glaring at Doffy, who was still looking up at him, as confident as ever. Why are you here? Doflamingo tilted his head for a moment, then began to laugh. Hey 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 hey, what's the matter, huh? Can't a guy come and visit an old friend, Doffy mused, eager to hear the beast's response. The fox intensified his glare, baring his teeth and growling at him now. I do not have friends. Now, answer me, why are you here? The fox roared at the end, making Doffy plug his ears with his pinkies to withstand the volume. That's pretty rude, ya yeah, no. Maybe I should come back later, when you're in a better mood. I know, I'll bring some chocolate with me next time. You like chocolate right? Hey hey hey, Doffy said, bursting out in laughter at his own joke. This sent the fox over the top. He roared, sending Doffy flying back the way he came, with him laughing all the while. Soon enough, he was gone, and the fox huffed, laying his head back down for another nap, trying to get that smile out of his mind. Doffy, back at the forest fell back world, suddenly laughing. A few seconds later he sat up, wiping a tear from his eye. My, my, he really is a rude one, hey hey hey. Chuckling slightly, Doffy decided to visit the rude little fox on a later date. For now, there was one more objective on his list. He had been trying to recreate his strings for many years now, being unsuccessful every time. But, he had realized something a few weeks ago. Before, he had been trying to will his strings to appear, letting his devil fruit do the hard work. He had never tried to use the new energy in his body, his chakra. He had started as soon as he had that revelation and he was somewhat successful. 
he was able to create chakra strings, light blue strings that were apparently used in the hidden sand villages puppet techniques. It was close, but it wasn't what he wanted. He could feel that there was more, that he could create a true string. He extended his arm, concentrating his chakra at his middle finger. Instantly, a blue chakra string was there, waving in the slight breeze. He didn't stop there. He focused more and more chakra, the effort beginning to make Doffy sweat a bit and closed his eyes in concentration. He sat there focusing all the chakra he could, and when he met his limit, he opened his eyes and grinned. A white string was there, waving in the slight breeze. The Hockage sat back in his chair, thinking about the events he just saw through his crystal ball. He had some free time today, and decided to use it to check up on various ninja, including Naruto. When he first saw Naruto sitting there in the forest, he wasn't sure what to think. Curious he kept observing and was very surprised when the nine-year-old boy suddenly fell back, bursting into laughter. Slightly bewildered, the aging ninja looked on, curious to see what he would do next. He was not disappointed. He was very well aware of the ability to create chakra strings, and of how most simply wrote him off as a puppeteer technique. Using chakra strings in battle was a subtle art, one that Haruzen could see Naruto use very proficiently. That wasn't what shocked him though. It was what happened next. The boy continued to pour more and more chakra into the blue chakra string until, finally, something happened. It was slow at first, but, starting at the boy's fingertip, the thin blue string gained solidity, becoming a stark white. He had seen something similar to this before. Another Uzumaki who was also Naruto's mother. Her chakra chains were a powerful weapon that could restrain even tailed beasts. Just what these, strings, were capable of, Haruzen didn't know, but the, professor, in him couldn't wait to see them in action. Kakashi was antsy. The last time he felt antsy was three years ago, when the Hokage booted him from Anbu. It was finally time, Naruto was graduating and he was going to lead his team. If he passed his test anyways. Getting dressed and exiting his apartment, Kakashi took out his book, began reading and made his way over to He Academy building. He wasn't actually reading though, he had too much on his mind. That night 12 years ago still replaying in his mind. He remembered sitting there, forced to watch and pray that his sensei, the fourth Hokage would be alright. But he wouldn't be alright. He remembered everything after that too. Throwing himself into Anbu, serving Danzo for a time until the third had put him back on the right track. All that time and not once did he think of him, Naruto. He hated it, his past self that made mistake after mistake. He wondered what it would be like if things went differently. Those thoughts never lasted long. Shinobi didn't have time for regrets. So here he was, entering the academy and preparing to meet his team three whole hours behind schedule. He approached the classroom, opened the door and let himself in. Looking inside, and surprised to not hear any of the usual yelling at his tardiness, he saw his new cute little students, and quickly came up with something witty to say. How to put this, you guys, dot are a little boring. The pink one frowned. The raven-harried one scowled. And the blonde one. He simply grinned. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.